Uh, Lucy, can I pick on you to start? Um, just uh, introduce yourself and um, tell us a bit about this work here, Refraction. Uh, so yeah, my name is Lucy Holland. I'm a composer and sound designer. Um, I work as a musical director. I work a lot with live performance. But I also build interactive spatial sound installations. Um, and what you can he see you here... See oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. I'll just take this one off. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a piece called Refraction that uh, I built in collaboration with some visual and lighting artists last year for the CCA. Uh, and it's uh, basically an interactive audiovisual piece that, as you can see and hear, registers movement. Um, the whole idea being that we wanted to create a virtual underwater and waterside environment and just ask the question, what would it sound like or how could you make a, a virtual space feel like you're swimming through water, was where it came from. Um, it uses a connect sensor uh, to track body and hand movement. Uh, and particularly what was a big focus for me in particular was um, how you can create a gradient of interaction um, so that there's not just one type of feedback. So the easiest way of explaining what's going on here is it would uh, hopefully most of the time pick up even the slightest movement so even if someone was a little shy or feeling a little vulnerable um, then there would be some kind of response and the braver and more creative you got with it as you can see from some of the dance moves that start to happen from the video <laughs> feedback um, the more responsive the sound would become um, and although there was uh, semi-interactive lighting and visuals, it was very sound-led in that the sound was fully interactive. 50% um, of it was generated from movement and 50% of it was uh, sound distortion techniques from already existing sound in the project. Um, so yeah, that's Refraction and that's me. Brilliant, <laughs> thank you so much. No um, so this is Kata Kata. Um, it was an exploration of using smartphones to mediate um, interactions in public spaces. So I found that often when you've got kinetic works people are, or interactive works in galleries, people are slightly cautious about engaging with them. Um, so I was wondering how we could use smartphones that were becoming super popular back in the, when I made it um, to mediate those interactions to try and encourage people to be a bit more playful in galleries. It's a really short video so it only played once. Um, basically it's a Jacob's Ladder toy that's like the wooden slats and when you tilt it it will flip flap all the way down and there's a microphone positioned halfway down the sculpture um, to capture the sound as it rotates. Um, you control it by using a web app um, so you flip your phone to mirror the movement of the sculpture and that will set off this kinetic reaction. Um, and then once it's captured the sound of the wooden blocks clattering against each other, you can then move your phone in space to scrub through the recording that you make and like play with the sound of the movement that you've just triggered. Um, it appealed to children and grannies alike. Um, and this was, it was lucky enough to be exhibited at a few places, including Blank Arcade at Hannah McClure Centre, Talbot Rice Gallery and the National Museum of Scotland, which is the biggest challenge because it was many, many children, very excited <laughs> and moving parts. But it survived a whole two weeks and 250,000 people passed through that hall. So that was one of my proudest achievements was getting that to work. Um, so yeah, under the hood, it's not as minimal as you see. There's a computer in there, there's a sound card, there's Arduinos and web like servers, so I quite like hiding it all in this magical monolithic structure. Um, so yeah, that's Kata Kata. <laughs> that's great, thank you so much. Um, oh, that's my one. Um, <laughs> I think mine's working. I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the book, of, this, this is a picture of a really early prototype of, of, uh, of a project I'm working on now, which isn't, isn't finished yet. I wish I had a slicker picture. But I don't yet. Um, so the Book of Knowledge of Impractical Musical Devices is, is a project I'm working on at the moment, which is based loosely on a 12th century Arabic text that's the first instance of robotic musical instruments, um, first, first written instruments uh, in history of robotic uh, and automated musical instruments. So I thought that was really fascinating thing. So I've been designing a set of instruments that are kind of inspired by some of the ideas in that book. Um, this one is called The Day That Won't Happen Again, and it is is inspired um, uh, partially from the, from the news a couple of years ago when they recorded the, uh, when astrophysicists recorded the sound of two black holes collapsing to create a gravitational wave. 
and made that chirping sound. Uh, that was quite big news in 2017, which kind of, uh, like, like many people, it, it blew my mind to think that we were listening to an event that had happened four billion years ago. Um, and, but then I started realizing that I really like to record sounds all the time and that I was doing the same thing but on a micro level. So the idea that like I was recording a sound but by the time the sound had, energy had hit the microphones then the moment had already passed um, and that I was actually doing it as a sort of a drug to kind of make myself feel like I could revisit that moment again um, even though it had already passed and that I was never going to be in that moment ever again. But listening to the sound was kind of helping my brain pretend that I would be able to go back to that moment again. Um, so this is an instrument um, that I recorded 180 sounds uh, in a single day um, in December. And I cut it up into 100 little pieces and every day of the calendar year from now uh, up until uh, the earth is destroyed by the sun, this, uh, this instrument will rearrange um, all of those sounds into a new uh, sequence so and it won't rearrange it again so uh, each day is, is different um, so I can try to revisit that day through the sounds I recorded but it will be jumbled up uh, in the same way it is in my head so that's that's that one and there are a couple other instruments I've built along similar lines so that's that's the book of knowledge unfinished should be finished in the next six weeks or so what do you think Ed? That's how <laughs> work on it. Uh, so yeah that's uh, that's the idea cool Thanks so much for introducing those um, projects uh, to us in that really quick fire way. Um, I wonder if we should just start with quite a general question, just about the role of sound within video games and other, other art forms as well. Um, because it, it seems to me that in all of your work, um, sound is really the central factor or the driving force behind the experience. Um, and it might be fair to say that there's a more common assumption that the design of sound is something that might happen after um, a narrative is written or visuals are done, um, rather than being so crucial or part of this early process. And I just wondered if, if your work's about challenging that idea or if you had any reflections around that. <laughs> <laughs> You're on. Is it working? <laughs> Um, I don't know if I should hold this. That or sounds good. Here. Okay, it's like a tiny mic. Uh, I think I, I'm sure Kirsty and Jan would probably agree that I think most audio people always want to find an opportunity to push sound <laughs> to the front. Usually because, as you say, in a lot of especially commercial mediums, I guess that is used to enhance. I think uh, Miriam and Keely both touched on the idea of salience earlier, and sound is obviously a really big resource that game designers will use to provide feedback for a player. Uh, and for me, I've always liked the idea of um, bringing a player or a person or a musician, I suppose, in the sense of music, into uh, creating what they're hearing as well. So um, that's kind of a big motivator for me and my sound installations. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's also important, like, we've gone through loads of different iterations of, of sound in games, right? Like, we started off with, like, Pong, and, like, sound was, it was such a minimal aesthetic that sound was, like, a big part of the effect of Pong. Mm. And then we got through this, like, Xbox 360 generation where you had to be able to switch out the soundtrack for your own personal music. <laughs> and then we switched into, like... <laughs> mobile gaming where the music was such a like there was such limited space available for sound that we had to keep samples short and it was looping and repetitive and people just said oh forget it I'm going to switch this off or I'm commuting I'm not going to bother people with the sound of exploding candy um, and now we're getting into this into these new technologies where sound is so so important in creating immersive experiences in like AR and VR like how do you locate things that are not visible and how do you like use that auditory salience to like draw attention and just like creating soundscapes that are evolving when you've got such a huge gameplay like you have to have this soundscape that's that's interesting and engaging so that you can just mm -hmm. encourage the player to have those peaks and troughs of narrative moments so yeah I think it's it's an important thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, there's definitely like uh, in the sound world both I think in terms of film as well as in games sound people have a real chip on their shoulder about like you know it's like no one ever pays attention to sound you know there's like <laughs> you talk to especially sound designers for like for film or for commercials you know you get this a lot where like they'll spend six months on the visual edit for a commercial and then they'll send it to a set to ten sound designers and they'll be like great um, by Monday we need to finish sound 
you know, and, and, and so of course there's this kind of yeah. culture within the sound design industry of like, no one ever listens to us, right? Like it's, we're always the last people to be thanked, which is too bad. And it's, it's always something I think maybe that is what I'm, I, I do try fighting against in yeah. a way. And I guess maybe my method for fighting against it is to just kind of like, well, slightly try to distance myself from that aspect of it and just think like, well, how can I try to manipulate, approach things from a sound perspective entirely, you know? So, the, so like, what is it that sound does well? And then what is it that sound does poorly? And then like, what is it that other arts forms do really well and can be pulled in and applied to sound? I think that's the, that's, that's the approach I try to take rather than try to get too bitter. I've been bitter, I have been bitter, <laughs> and it's, 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 it's not a good place to be. It's nice to, to not be bitter. In yeah, <laughs> uh, that leads on really nicely to the next question I was going to ask, which is, um, is really about the fact that you all work, have worked in, in video games in, in, a, in different ways, um, but that you also work in film, installation arts and other sectors as well. Um, and also thinking about some of the things that Pat raised earlier, um, just how you think um, Design, designing sound for video games might be different to designing sound for other mediums, but then also what you bring in from your experiences in these other worlds as well. I mean, I think for me, video games I see as just another medium to play with. Yeah. Um, like, I've, I've not come from a game design background or a, a game playing background even, and when I discovered games, it was through like traditional games, like toys and board games and then realizing that you could do like sound based um, game based compositions so I think like it just it's just a new context that you mm -hmm. can apply these compositional techniques to but with the level of interactivity that's possible in it it's sort of it's a nice way of sharing like this musicing experience with the wider public like you're giving that um, compositional um, like agency over to the user, and I think that's a really interesting difference between games and other mediums that yeah, I think yeah. is what draws us in. Yeah. yeah, I think that's been a really big thing for me as well with, um, like you say, from the compositional point of view as well, mm -hmm. because my beginnings as any kind of musician has always been from a compositional background, more traditionally, and then uh, moved over into the digital arena as I've uh, progressed through that, but um, certainly one thing that I just love about music and sound anyway is the idea that it can never be the same again, which kind of like touches on what Jan was saying a bit about his project inspirations as well. Uh, and that's what excites me a lot about game design, actually, uh, mm -hmm. and the opportunity to try and create something that can be changeable and responsive truly mm -hmm. to what the player's doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. I hadn't really thought about it that way before. I think you're like, in some ways, game design is, audio, music composition for game in a game design context is sort of like, the logical next step of what composers in the 50s and 60s were really obsessed with, you know, of that kind of just like, yeah. or earlier, yeah. I suppose, that kind of like generative algorithmic approach to composition mm -hmm. actually is probably best applied, you know, to <laughs> game design as is a really interesting thing. Um, yeah, to see that. I mean, I certainly got like, I got into games design totally by accident, like in similar ways, I, I think. Uh, and so, yeah, and I think. What's been interesting for me is how it, it definitely ends up when you dive into these different genres, how it ends up feeding in both directions. You know, like yeah. the, the piece that I worked on that's in the show here, in the video game show, the, the Ruffle Pillar, was a game that we designed using technology, using the game tracks, which I had been using to make, to do musical performances before. So I, I, I found these controllers. I'd designed a musical performance for them, then we had them sitting around the studio. Then I was kind of like, well, why don't we make a game with this? And at the same time, Jonathan had been really obsessed with like restraint games and all this kind of stuff. So we started thinking, well, that could cross over. And then we made a game that actually has, it has sound in it, but like you couldn't really hear it. So like actually it had very little to do with sound and it had more to do with that kind of like several steps of overlapping that then ended up there. Uh, and now I'm in a museum. So this is kind of like funny kind of uh, trajectory that comes yeah, each 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 genre feels fit can can feedback on the previous genre, I think, mm, or yeah. feed forward. Cool. 
I think we've probably just got time to sneak in one more question. And because we are in a museum, I hope you don't mind if I ask you a museum-y question, which is that um, we, we're always sort of, the sort of words that we all talk about all the time at the moment is immersive. You know, we want these immersive experiences for our visitors. And you all have experience of creating installations for museums and galleries. And I just wonder how you, how you kind of feel about that, being asked by a museum to please can you create us like a fun, playable, immersive experience and does that, are you happy about that or does it ever sort of, you know, do we need, do we need to interrogate why we want to do that a bit more? That's kind of a hard question. <laughs> um. I'd say yes. I'm, re I'm super skeptical of the term immersive. Yeah. I think it's really problematic. It's like, what are we, what are we escaping? Like what's, what, like the, the world is so messed up. Like why, why do we, like I feel like there, there, to me there's a direct correlation between how messed up the world is and how immersive people want their experiences. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know, I really, really think we, we should be doing the opposite of immersing ourselves in non-reality. Like, we need to be immersing ourselves in reality, you know? And I think, so for me, I find it really problematic. And, I, and like, I know Adorno is dismissed by a lot of people now and from this side of things, but I definitely agree in some ways with his idea that, like, if you're trying to create a separate reality, uh, you're probably a fascist. And I think, like, that's, uh, I mean, not, boy, that was so... <laughs> No what one here is a fascist. <laughs> so clear. There are no fascists in the room. This, this, uh, uh, boy, uh, God, that's not what I meant. But, uh, anyway, I, it's like it's. I just, I, yeah, I, I think immersive, immersive. I, we do. I don't know what the answer is, but I, my answer to your last question is definitely yes. We need to be. We need to question why we want to be immersed. Yes. Have immersive experiences. I think it's a step forward, even having sound in the gallery. Yeah. Like not mm. having to like have the sound experiences tethered to a wall with some like clickety clackety headphones. Um, I think like actually having sound within galleries and the playfulness that that could encourage. Like galleries are traditionally such silent and sterile places. Mm. I think bringing that liveliness yeah. back in will encourage like a different way of engaging with with work mm. potentially. And being part of like a physical shared space, mm. right? Like you say, instead of with headphones. And I think mm. what you guys are saying is something, I don't know if this is the answer, but it's why I found movement such an interesting uh, artistic medium, I suppose, to explore in my um, installations as well. Uh, just to try and combine mm. that physical and real with the virtual mm -hmm. and immersive. <laughs> 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 yeah, shared experience is an interesting thing. Because yeah. it's like, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, like I guess a lot of times immersiveness is, is the, the assumption is that it's for a single yeah. person. Or escapism. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Like Whereas a group thing, thing and then having sound which is, can be listened to by multiple people at once is interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's more yeah. on the augmented scale of immersion, right? Like yeah. you're just trying to make people look by adding a few little bits in. But I suppose any music is augmented reality, right? <laughs> 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 <Totally>. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's just been a fascinating discussion. Thank you all so much. And let's have a little round of applause. <laughs>